to, to kick off then, how, how did you how did your move to Rangers come about then? Um, I was at Barrow at the time, um, and obviously Bealsey was the gaffer's assistant up there, and I'd had Bealsey for the um, best part of four years at Liverpool, um, from 16s all the way through to the resis. Um, and yeah, it was just it was just the start of December, and Bealsey gave me a text and said, we need a chat, here's my new number give me a ring when you can so I was like I just fell out of the team at, at Barrow a couple of weeks before and I was thinking oh he might know someone who wants to take me um, try and get me a move to keep me playing again um, and I remember speaking to uh, a couple of my mates Harry Wilson and Tom Brewitt because they both knew Billsy really well as well and them two were just like oh he's, he's taking me to Rangers he's taking me to Rangers and I'm like yeah whatever no chance uh, oh so I did a swear or not but that was uh, that was my reaction anyway and he said um he was like, no, he's going to take you, he's going to take you. I was like, all right, whatever. So rang him that afternoon, had a little chat with him, um, and he was just like, right, let's let's cut the small talk. Uh, we're sending Robbie McCrory on loan in in the January window, um, and we need to bring a number three in. Um, the gaffer and, obviously me, the gaffer and the staff have all sat down and obviously know all the staff really well. Um, and we feel like you're the one, you're the one for the job if you're, uh, if, you, if you're up for it. And I was like, well, kind of a bit of a no-brainer like no disrespect to Barrow but to go from a club like Barrow to a club the size of Rangers it was um, it was a no-brainer and he was like oh well don't rush into it think about it speak to your mum and dad speak to your agent <clears throat> and I was like definitely don't need to but right okay um, so I'll never forget like my dad doesn't usually get involved he's um, fairly laid back let's be waiting on decisions rang them rang my mum and dad they were in Egypt and my dad was like um, I had a chat and I was like oh there's a bit of a curveball here um, Beals has just rang me and Rangers want to take me in January and my dad was like what are you doing on the phone to me then I told him I'm just letting you know and he was like oh no you need to ring him back now just done done don't care what the numbers are don't care what it is you're done just do it I was like oh, yeah it's kind of where my head's at as well and then that was that tech Beals back that afternoon and just said yeah let's let's get it done whatever it takes let's get it done and then um, and then yeah it was a long it was a long six, seven weeks, something like that, waiting for everything to go through, waiting for Robbie's loan to Morton to go through. Um, and then, obviously, as soon as that got done, um, my bags were packed and I was uh, straight up the road. Yeah, it must have been a dream move for you. What, um, what's Michael Beale like to train again? Obviously, we hear all the time that he's, he's a brilliant tactician and um, obviously he's just been appointed manager of QPR, but what's he really like? He's the best I've worked with... Um, I've had the pleasure of working some good managers, good coaches all the way through since I started as a kid at Liverpool. Um, but Bills, he just he sees a different game to everyone else. He's, um, he really does. His training sessions are unbelievable. Like he just makes you feel like a kid again in training. Like training sessions are so fun, so enjoyable. Um, but tactically as well, he's always spot on. He knows how to set his teams up when you're playing against a low block, a high block, like the amount of detail that goes into the work that the rest of the staff did as well to be fair Scotty Mason the analysis and the gaffer and Gaz Mac TC <clears throat> the amount of work they put in to set the team up um, and the fact they recruited that whole team it was always going to take a bit of time to, for everything to fall into place and a couple of windows to get all the pieces they needed but um, they yeah, all just clicked into place for that for that third full season they had together and then that team for the last two years has gone on and done pretty decent things um, now I have to ask you about Stephen Gerrard as well um, how you previously described him as your as your idol I mean, what was it like playing under him did you ever did you have a relationship with him at Liverpool um, yeah so I first trained with the first team at Liverpool when I was 16 um, so the gaff was still playing so I had like two years something like two years two and a half years before he left to go to America um, so I had like a, li- like a tiny bit of relationship with him like he would kind of known who I was um, but it was when he came back to Liverpool as the in the academy set up um, when that's like kind of when the relationship properly started I did quite a lot of sessions with with the 18s and stuff um, and if I wasn't playing with the res the lads who didn't play train the next day with the uh, with the 18s um, and for me I used to love it like I've known TC Tommy Coulshaw for a, for a long time so I've always really got on with him and him and him and Stevie were running the running the eighteen, and I just still love training with them just because I asked Stephen Gerrard there, like it still just gives you that that buzz, that 
like that was the biggest session of the week for me training with the kids who were all two years younger than me but um, so I did that for probably six months once a week I'd train with them and it was always for me just like this is the session you need to go and he's Steven Gerrard he knows everyone in the game and if you can leave an impression you never know where that leads you so um, so that's kind of where the relationship started and I remember the day he came in uh, when he was taking the Rangers job like we'd all seen the, the rumours and stuff and he'd come in the academy in the morning in his, in his new Rangers suit and um, like he was saying his goodbyes to everyone in the academy and I just I'll never forget like I went over to him had a quick chat and I just said oh like if you ever need a keeper gaff you know where I am like you know who I am you know where I am don't forget about me and we both just had a laugh about it and then and then that was it. Six months later, um, six months later, the phone call came. Must have been like moving from home to home. You know, so many familiar faces at Ibrox. <laughs> yeah, well, I've always said Liverpool and Glasgow is just the exact same city with just a different accent. Um, football addicted. Such a similar city. Like everyone, working class cities. Um, everyone's just addicted to football. And um, for me, like forget the scouts, um, forget the Liverpool contingency who were up there. Obviously, I knew quite a few of the boys, but like even without them, I feel like the city's the exact same. Um, but obviously, it was so easy, so easy to settle in. Knowing obviously all the first team staff, uh, Jordan Rossett was there. He was in my age group, so was Ryan Kent. Flannel was up there as well. Um, so to walk in the door, it was. It was really easy. And then obviously I knew Brandon Barker, Shea Ojo joined us as well. So there's quite a few boys I already knew and it just felt like it was really easy to settle in and felt like home straight away. Yeah. yeah. Obviously your running only appearance for the club was a, a seven-minute kind of cameo um, away to Kamano. What, what was that like playing in front of the Rangers fans? Just amazing. Just like, it just everything just worked out perfectly. Um, obviously last game of the season, um, Greaves had been sent off two weeks before for his um his karate <laughs> kick at Hib. Um so I was on the bench and my mum and dad had come up. Um my missus and her mate were at the game. I had like four of my mates had come up from Liverpool for it as well. So it was just like it just worked out perfectly. And then so Wes gets his dead leg and I was just like, that might actually happen this. And he carried on for about 30 seconds and then he just goes down. I was like, that was it. Gaffer calls me back. And apart from that, it's just like you just forget about everything then it's just like like that panic station just like right just forget about everything else just get on the pitch and see what happens and and yeah seven seven minutes whatever it was but it's the one appearance that no one can ever take away from me that's it yeah is it maybe a slight regret that you never had the chance to play a competitive game at Ibrox um, in a way yeah like obviously if if you could hand pick it you'd pick You'd rather play at Ibrox than anywhere else. But um, for me, I was always told, you're coming up with the number three. Um, but if your chance ever comes, you've got to be ready. That was what the gaffer said. Um, but in all honesty, when I signed for Rangers, I didn't expect to play one game. So the way I see it is, I'm, I know I was lucky to I was lucky to be there. I was lucky to be involved. But um, I was even luckier that everything panned out the way it did. And I actually managed to play a game. So, um, so yeah, it's one more appearance than I expected. So... I mean, that's interesting, Andy, because, you know, as a number three, what actually is your role then? You obviously mentioned you didn't really expect to play any games for Rangers. What's your role within the kind of goalkeeping department then? Is it just to kind of provide support for, um, you know, like sort of Wes, John McLaughlin, Al, Al-, Al- McGregor? Um, and can I be a, you know, and obviously push them as well? That's it, yeah. Um, the chat I had with Bills in the gaffer um, before I signed was, do you know what sort of character I am? Do you know what sort of lad I am? Um, I'm lively in training. I just love training. I'm not one of them who's who's ever gonna like forget about training and and just go through the motions and stuff. I love training and I just I love playing football. So um, that's always been my attitude to training. And obviously that's what the Gaffer and Bales had seen over the years. And he just said, "You've got to come here and drive the standards in training. Don't be lazy. Don't be comfortable. Um, you've got to push the boys. You've got to push yourself. You've got to drive the standards in training." And to be fair, we had an unbelievable group for. Um, for training at Rangers there was a lot of really really good trainers who um, who would never let the standards slip um, and driving driving them standards every day and everyone everyone played their own part in that and obviously that was um, that was my role yeah and just just be ready just support the boys um, 
obviously, if I'm playing, if I'm behind Greeks, the chances are if you sat behind Greeks, you're not going to get many games because he's absolutely unbelievable. And then the number twos that I've worked under as well, Wes and John, Wes has gone on to do it in the champ this last couple of years at Sheffield United and John's done enough, played for Hearts, played for Sunderland, Scottish national team. So the fact you're behind the Scottish international and Alan McGregor or Wes and Alan McGregor, chances are you're not going to get too many appearances. But um, all three unbelievable to work with. Colin Stewart as well, the goalie coach, had a really good relationship with him and it was just so easy to, so easy to be there, so easy to work with and Obviously, them, them three keepers have been at all different levels, seen all different things and the experiences and stuff they've got. It was so good for me just to be the younger one of the group and, and looking up to them, picking little bits from each keeper. Um, all three of them were fantastic with me. Yeah. How did you go on with um, Alan McGregor? Um, he's some character, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he's, um, he's my hero, honestly. What a guy. Um, he's... He's a lot different to what people expect. Like, um, genuinely, like the most professional, the most professional keeper I've ever worked with. Just like he's the first in the, he's in the training ground at about four in the morning and getting ready for training for about six hours before we get started. And always in the gym, always doing his own individual stuff. Trains, trains like you'll never believe. And um, Obviously, that's why he's still doing it at 40. That's no fluke. Um, that's down to the work and the dedication he's gotten. Um, and away from the game as well, like, he's always the first to text me for a round of golf or go for a bit of food, go for a pint if we get a chance. And, and when he's misses, the amount they've done for, for me and my misses in Glasgow over the last three and a half years is, um, is above and beyond what, what teammates you'd expect, really. And, um, yeah, he's really took me under his wing and, and his misses as well. They are... Uh, they really looked after us and can't speak highly enough about, about him and his missus. Obviously, him on the pitch and the pair of them off the pitch have been absolutely unbelievable for, for me and my missus as well. So, yeah, yeah, perfect teammate. He's um, he's obviously signed on for another year. Uh, perhaps surprised a few people by doing that because obviously, come on, as a sub in the Scottish Cup final, appeared to be his farewell. But he signed on for another year, which is great news for Rangers. Um, what do you think lies ahead for McGregor after? You know when he finally does hang up the hang up the gloves. I feel like do you think he'll move into coaching or management or be involved in football in some sort of way? I don't know. It's a it's a conversation I've had with him a couple of times to be honest. Like because um, I've known from day dot. Like I've always wanted to go whenever the football finishes. Coaching is my next step. Um, I first started coaching for Liverpool when I was nineteen, taking um, taking the keepers in the younger age groups and stuff. And that's just something that's always interested me. Um, Liverpool were unbelievable and providing me the um, the opportunity to go into my coaching badges and stuff. So to get both my way for B outfield and goalkeeping sorted, like I just got the bug for it straight away, and it was something I always wanted to do. Um, I don't think Greaves Greaves has already he said to me like he wasn't. He's still not hundred percent sure, but I think um, someone that's bit, had the career he's had, had the experiences he's had. Obviously in Scotland, playing for Rangers for for donkey's years, hundreds of appearances and then also with different experiences in the Premier League, the Championship over in Turkey as well, international football. He's, he's been there, done it and he's got plenty of badges to show for it and I just think that um, the amount I've learned off him without him actually even coaching me, just watching him do certain things and the way he handles himself, the way he prepares for training, the way he prepares for games. Um, my personal opinion is if he could if he could be involved in, in coaching or something along them lines, there's a lot of keepers he can help um, and push in the right direction and show what it takes to play for, for Rangers, for your national team, play to 40. He's going to be 41 by the time this season finishes. So um, that's my opinion on it. But look, Greaves is a, he's been in the game for a long, long, long time. And maybe for him, he's, he's ready to take a step back and go and enjoy a few rounds of golf and a few pints and... <laughs> enjoy his retirement when that time comes and that's that's up to him but um, I'm sure he'll make the right decision for him Yeah Just to kind of focus on you now I mean you obviously became a bit of a, a cult hero with the, with the fans uh, what kind of relationship did you have with him and how did that all come about? It's not, I don't, to be honest I, I genuinely don't even know they just seem to they just seem to take to me and um, like I just I just loved everything about the club it was just like 
like it was the best three and a half years of my life, just the experiences I've had. Um, obviously, being involved at Liverpool, you get um, a little bit of a of a feel of how big the, the club is when you're in the younger age. Everyone knows how big Liverpool is. Um, there's a couple of trips we went on um, to Malaysia and Indonesia and we were playing in front of like 15, 20,000 when we were like 16 years old. So like that was the first time I thought, wow, this is mad. Um, but then following Rangers um, for them three and a half years, going to all the games, home and away, away in Europe and, and seeing the numbers of fans that travel and how passionate Ibrox is and um, that's just something for me. Like I just couldn't not get, just get sucked into you just like a little kid again. And the way I felt about Liverpool, um, it didn't take long before Rangers was like it just it just gripped me. And once it gets older, it's hard to uh, you just you just all in. And um, yeah, so I, I genuinely don't know how, um, but I just loved every minute of it. Um, and I think the fans could tell that I just love being there, love being part of it. Um, unbelievable squad to be part of. Obviously, a really good relationship with all the uh, with all the staff. And for me, it was just a dream. And I think everyone could tell I was living the dream. So, um, so yeah. So you need to tell us about the road to to the title as well. I mean, uh, what a season that must have been to to have been a part of. Yeah, it was just yeah, everything fell into place. Um, it was just like everything just clicked that year for us. Um, Obviously, it was the COVID, the COVID break. We'd all not play football for a while. It was the longest, hardest pre-season. I'm pretty sure everyone's done. There was involved. Um, loads of time to prepare. Loads of time on the pitch before the season. Um, and it just seems to... It's one of them, like, it's hard to say, put a finger on what it was. But I always think, like, we just didn't have a choice that year. If they'd have done, if they'd done the 10 in a row, I feel like... Probably the manager would have got the sack, the staff all leave after the squad get kicked out. Um, and it's a rebuild from top to bottom, um, would have been my opinion. Um, and I don't know if that was just subconsciously on our minds, but um, it was for me, I looking back now, I just thought it would do or die. You didn't really have a choice, it had to be it was that year, or chances are your time's done and um, there'll be a big reshuffle. Um, we just never mentioned anything. It was just, we all knew what we needed to do and everyone was so focused and it was just one game at a time and, and let's see what happened. And then I think it was like eight, nine games in before we finally finally dropped points and we had someone like ridiculous clean sheet records and um, for whatever reason, everything just clicked into place, fell into place and turned out to be a half decent season. <laughs> I mean, what, what was Stephen Gerrard's message at the start of the season? Did, did he mention 10 in a row at all and the importance of stopping it? No, not, not really, no. Like, because we all knew um, that conversation I had with the gaffer before he left to go to Rangers. I always remember he said, I've got three years to win the league. And like, me not knowing a lot about Scottish football, I just thought like the board had said, right, obviously we're not quite at the level of, of what they are yet. We've obviously only been back in the Prem for a year or two financially we'll be a bit behind because they'll have European money and, and all that stuff. Um I've got three years to stop I've got three years to win the title and never really actually I never knew they'd already done seven. Um obviously until you come up here and you hear they're already singing about it three years in advance and, and all that stuff and you soon realise, right, that's why that's why you've got three years and um but yeah it was never really mentioned in anything like we wanted to win the league obviously in the first year I was there and the second year got stopped for COVID and um, yeah as soon as you as soon as you realise how important the tennis obviously being not being involved in the club beforehand and um, only knowing a little bit about Scottish football and the old firm and no one's ever actually done the 10 before you soon realise that um, it would have been unbearable to be in Glasgow on our side if uh, if they had managed to do the 10 and we all knew nothing needs to be said. It was one of them. Everyone knows what's happening, and everyone knows how how badly that would look on us as a as a squad. And um, if we were in the squad that the guy the ten finished on them, that would have been um, that wouldn't have been nice to be a part of. So yeah, nothing really got said, but we all knew that this was our uh, last chance to loon, and it all fell into place. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the Celtic fans singing about 10 in a row um, for, for years and years. Um, did, obviously, there was a, 
bit of gloating from the Celtic end as well, not just the, the fans, but the players on the pitch as well. Um, did that give the Rangers kind of extra motivation? Did it make it even sweeter to stop down the row? Um, well, yeah, because to, to be honest, like you never want to. Scotland's a different. Scotland's just a different world to everywhere else. So like, <laughs> um, it's like I've always been a massive Liverpool fan, and um, but through my lifetime, Liverpool have always had like different spells of being right up there, being lower down, being a mid-table team. Like it goes up and down, and sometimes like they'll have a rivalry with Chelsea for a few years when it was Benitez and Mourinho, and then at the moment it's Liverpool and City, and then. In the early 2000s, it was Man United and Arsenal. And, like, there's always cycles in England of, like, there's always two teams at the top and they can change at any given time, really. Whereas I know Rangers went down the league and it was um, it was only Celtic and no particular competition. Um, but in Scotland, it's Rangers and Celtic nailed on for 99% of trophies. That's just of how big the clubs are the re- the money they can bring in the wages and the transfers they can spend the money on is completely different to every other team in Scotland really so um, so yeah it's, it's hard to you just can't compare Scotland to anywhere else in the world like there's no one else <clears throat> bar an absolute miracle realistically there's nowhere else who should actually be within 15-20 points of the of the old firm clubs yeah, I mean Scott Brown, he was always the, the kind of pantomime villain against Rangers. Um, obviously, I loved the wind up and he had a, a bit of beef with Morelos and Ken and, and even Halliday. Um What was the kind of general opinion of Brown in, in, in the iBooks dressing room? Never really spoke about him. To be honest, like obviously he's, he's been there for been there for numbers of years. Um, obviously, he'll be viewed as a legend on on the other side of the city. But for us, like it was more just. You've just got to keep your eyes on on what we're doing, focus on what we can control. And a lot of that was, um, especially playing against them and playing against him, you've got to keep your emotions under check. You've got to stay under control and you know what he's going to want to do. Um, and to be give credit to him, he was unbelievable at doing what he was doing. The amount of times he's, he's wound people up, got people sent off that can change the game. Um, that was the thing for us. We've got to just don't let him get in your head. And like you go to their place, don't let the fans get in your head. You just got to control, control what we can control, and that's keeping your discipline on the pitch. Um, ignore the crowd, ignore the opposition players, and just got to do your job. Um, and I think obviously the first first year, eighteen months of the gaffer being there, our, our disciplinary record was um, pretty shambolic, um, and that's that can cost you. That cost you over the over the season if you're missing players for. For three games through suspension, or if you get a couple of red cards in the season, you're missing a lot of games. If that's a big player, and um, at the start the squad depth wasn't as good as it was, or it is now, um, that costs you big time over over a season. So um, I think our discipline for the last two seasons has been has been absolutely spot spot on. So I think that's definitely played a part the uh, the shift in the mentality and the discipline of the of the players. Um, keeping 11 men on the pitch for for the majority of the time and managing suspensions and things like that, not letting people wind you up and getting stupid red cards. That's definitely helped us uh, in the last two years. Yeah. On the subject of playing against Celtic, I mean, um, you know, I think it was, was it Nico Katic that scored the winner at Celtic Park? Um, obviously, Stephen Gerrard, who, you know, remember the, the, the celebrations in Sky Sports. Um, it was the first time Rangers had won at Celtic Park in six, seven years. Uh, it was a massive occasion. What 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 was that like? As a Rangers player, yeah, it was a uh, yeah, it was a that was a good one to be involved in. Good one to be involved in. Um, just another typical old Ferguson, another crazy game. Um, Raz scored a really good goal. I think they got the deflection to equalise in the first half, and then Big Nico puts his meter on the end of Barnes cross, <laughs> and then it went um, it went pretty wild, but. He's one of them. Even then, that game, Buff got sent off late on. He, he goes through one-on-one. He could have shot. Ref thinks he's dived. I, I can't even remember if it was a dive or not, but he gets sent off for diving and then Bealsy loses his head and he's starting riots on the touchline and Bealsy gets sent off. And, and then when the whistle went, it was just like, that felt just like a big, 
we'd obviously we beat them in um, we beat them at Ibrox a couple of times under the gaffer, but that just felt like a big step to go there and win for the first time in I think it was nine years, ten years, something like that, since they'd been all the way down. Um, it felt like a big step at the time for right, we've been there, we can go to their place and we can win. That's the mentality change. Like, right, we've done it now, we know how to do it. Um, it's just about keeping them standards and knowing we can go into that game with belief like we've been in and we won last time. So we can go and do it again. How do you compare the experience of winning a, an old firm game at Ibrox to Celtic Park? Obviously, you've got the full crowd behind you at Ibrox and at Celtic Park, you know, you, you obviously silence the, the home crowd. Yeah, it's, um, it's like, they're both just as good. They're, just, they're good in different ways, obviously. When you've got the 50,000 behind you at Ibrox, um, it turns it turns wild and it's good to have that much support. Um, but then on the flip side, to go away to their place and you've only got seven hundred fans who who were tucked away in a little uh, tucked away in a little corner. It's a it's a much different atmosphere, much different feeling. But, um, but yeah, it's always nice to go to their place and uh, and get a decent result. It's a uh, it's a good laugh. I mean, before you arrived um, at Ibrox, Andy. The, the, the crowds the way crowds were around about 7,000 um, each um, with Celtic Park and iBooks would you like to see that return? 1 million percent the amount of times I've said this to people um, I understand for for the reasons that obviously the amount of season tickets that both clubs sell um, that's just the way it is at the moment but um, we had a, like I love watching all the old the old old firms on Sky Sports and you look at both away ends and they've both got a full full stand each all they've got like a proper following. Um I understand the safety reasons and the ticket reasons that it's probably quite chaotic for the police to control and stewards and stuff. Um but from a selfish point of view, like the the semi final this year at Hamden, proper old school, 50-50. I just that's me that I'm all over that. Um <laughs> And, and and it just makes a difference to the game. Like I'd much rather they brought five six thousand to Ibrox as long as we get to take five six thousand to to their place. It's um, just a proper a proper following. Just you're not there's only bloody six hundred seven hundred tucked away in the corner. And now nah, for me, I'm I'm all about a proper proper away end. Yeah, and now obviously you were pictured in the away end at Blackpool <laughs> recently. Um, <laughs> you enjoyed that, but I take it it's probably is it maybe on your bucket list to um, is it maybe on your bucket list to uh, be in the, the, the away end at Celtic Park one day as a Rangers fan? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, I've already. Uh, well, the good thing about it, it worked out perfectly the Blackpool game. So we um, we just trained on Saturday morning, and a few mates was coming down. A few of the lads on Open Glasgow were. Uh, we're coming down and me and mate Marks have been texting me for weeks saying like you've got to come to Blackpool so I'm obviously I'm only in Liverpool at the moment so it's only like an hour up the road like you've got to come to Blackpool you've got to come to Blackpool and then it wasn't until like the week before I checked and I was like oh we're actually there's no game this week and we're just training I'm off on Sunday I was like I said to the missus oh, we need to go up to Glasgow and start emptying some stuff out of the flat um, Rains are playing in Blackpool should we go to Blackpool and then go up to Glasgow after and she's like yeah go on then I write sounds. So I text Jacko. Jacko sort of does a couple of tickets, and um, and yeah, just had a little uh, little afternoon out in Blackpool, and it was boss. To be fair, um, lots of lots of good people coming, saying some very nice things, and just enjoyed the day out. Got to go and um, went into the changes after the game, just to go and, and see the boys and see the staff and stuff. So I didn't really get good a chance to say goodbye because. I only found out after the Scottish Cup final that my contract wasn't getting renewed. So to go and have a good catch up with the boys and the staff and people like that um, was really nice. Um, but yeah, we play quite a lot of Friday night games in Wales. So, um, so I've already got quite a few football footballing ideas for weekends on my mind. Now I've got, I'll have a few weekends free. So, um, so yeah, my best, one of my best mates is down at Fulham at the moment. I've never seen him play for Fulham. So yeah, um, We'll hopefully get a chance to go and watch a few of his games. We'll be no doubt be up in Glasgow quite a few weekends, home and away for a few games. And um so yeah, I'm I'm still a I'm still a kid at heart, like a like I just love going to watch football, whoever it is. So I've already spoke to Calvin saying I need to have a little weekend in Amsterdam, go and watch Ajax and go and find Joel Rebo playing go and find Joel Rebo playing in the Prem somewhere as well. So um see so yeah, whenever I get a Friday night game. You'll, uh, chances are you'll find me in a football stadium somewhere in Europe that weekend. 
uh, yeah, I mean, just jumping back onto the the, the, the title winning season, um, we all saw the, the dressing room celebrations uh, at Ibrox. There were quite a few of them. Uh, what was that like to be a part of? And there's like kind of any uh, stories you can tell us? Just surreal. Just yeah, just an outpour of emotions. Um, the gaffer had said it was that. Was it, it was the St Mirren game? I think no. Or was that the last game? Of this? Can't. Oh no, it was St Mirren. Yeah. We played St Mirren on the Saturday and then they travelled to Dundee United the next day. Um, and I think that three points basically meant like we'd have to lose every game, they'd have to win every game for anything to change. So the gap was like, right, we beat St Mirren. Um, we'll have a few berries after the game. Um, and then we'll all go in, have recovery the next day and watch their game. Um, so obviously we that's the day we turned up and there's about 9 million people outside Ibrox and the party had started about 10 in the morning and um, and yeah, once we, once we won the game, it was just just an outpour of emotions just um, because we never really spoke about it and I was one that like, my mates had texted me when we were like 18 points clear, like, oh, you just won the league and all that and I'm like, no, 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 not until we've, not until we've won the league will I ever even jinx or admit to anything like that and that was the first time that like I think a lot of the boys were the same just like <clears throat> that was the first time we'd actually just thought right this is it and that was the first chance to have um, have a decent little party and a few bevies and yeah we just stayed in Ibrox and and enjoyed uh, enjoyed a few few bottles of bubbly I mean um, obviously the club was stunned with the, the, the sad passing of, of Jimmy Bell recently. Um, I know on your Twitter that you shared a picture of, of Jimmy um, after the, the league was, was, was secured. Um, what was he like as a man and how did you honour him? Oh, the best. Mr. Range is, is um, yeah, he is, he was the heartbeat of the club. He was the man who, he was the, he was the owner, he was the chairman, he was the manager, he was, he was everything. He was, um, yeah, like, uh, obviously we went to his funeral and uh, Big Andy Smiley uh, said a few words and um, he said one of his mates texted him from uh, from down in England saying, how come your kit man's passed away and like it's all over Sky Sports News? Like, that just sums him up. Like, there's a kit man, obviously, he passed away and there's not many kit men you see getting breaking news tickets on Sky Sports and um, he just meant everything to the club. He meant everything to the players, the staff. The fans loved him. Every other fan hated him, and he just thrived off it. He was, um, he was just a man. He set the standards. He, he quickly taught you everything you need to know about Rangers and what it means to be a Rangers player, what it means to work for Rangers. Um, he'd been there for 40, 35, 40 years, whatever it was, and he's seen some proper players come in and out of that door, and he never let you get too big for your boots, and. He was always the first to bring it back down to the ground. And um, I remember my first day, um, I was speaking to Raz and I was like, um, oh, where would you get the Under Armours from? Tight tops and stuff. He was like, oh, go speak to Jimmy. All right, sound. Like, I heard a few stories about him and I was like, uh, excuse me, Jimmy, can I get a, a tight top? It's like, it's a tight top. Uh, like the Under Armour stuff. He's like, you don't need Under Armour. It's like, this the first week I come, it was like minus five. It was Freeze! I was like, uh, I was just like, I just need an Under Armour gym. So Andy Gorham never wore an Under Armour. Oh shit! What am I supposed to say to that? I've just signed from Barrow, and he's throwing Andy Gorham's name at me. I was like, all right, sound, no worries, Jimmy. Sound. So I just walked off, went to the toilet, went in the gym or whatever. Come back to me locker, and he brought me a, a an Under Armour a snood and a pair of trousers, and I was like, oh, he's all right then, and he's not too bad. That's just that was Jimmy. He'd ask for something, he'd say you no chance. And then whatever you'd ask for, it just magically appear five, ten minutes later. And he always sorted us out. And yeah, just it was a that was a tough week. And I think that just obviously it's, I'm just devastated. I didn't get the chance to come to the bill with us. But um, but that Thursday night, the um, the Leipzig semi final, that was just him and Walter looking down on us. That was just it was written in the stars that there was only one there was only one thing going to happen that night after the uh, after the week we'd had and. The guy who was looking down on us. Yeah, I can hear the emotion in your voice when you're speaking about him. Um, I take it the whole kind of dressing room is devastated by his passing. Yeah, it was. Um, it was a rough, 
probably the hardest day in football I've ever had that. Um, because I was still on loan at I was on loan at Partick at the time, but um, I was always whenever I wasn't at a party, I'd go into Rangers or if we had a game, I think because we had a game on the Tuesday night for party. Um, knew I wasn't playing, so I went into Rangers and I was just going in to do my gym and stuff. Um, went in to do a little little spin on the bike, do my lows and whatever. Um, and I forget I woke up to a text from Nathan Evans and he texted me saying. Um, please tell me this Jimmy stuff isn't true. And I was like, that's weird. What, what, what's he on about? And I never even thought to like look on social media or, or whatnot, because you never know. People can just start making rumours up and, and all that stuff. And I just thought, oh, I just need to get in. And like, all, all like, it was just, it was in my head straight away. I was like, this isn't good, this. This isn't good. And, um, walked into the training ground and Caroline was behind the desk and she could just tell she'd been crying her eyes out and it just like hits you like a ton of bricks. She didn't even need to say anything. Um, obviously, if I hadn't seen that text or I didn't know what I was walking into, um, someone had had to drop the news to me, but um, but I'd had that text in the morning from Nathan and then seen, seen Caroline crying her eyes out and it was just like, oh, there's just... Yeah, it was tough. Um, obviously, all the boys, all the staff, all the people behind the scenes just shot to bits. It was the um, it was the heartbeat of the club, the heartbeat of the training ground, and you can't put into words what he meant to to the players, the staff, the fans. Um, so yeah, that's probably the that was the toughest day I've had in football. That obviously, it's, I suppose it's fitting in the way that the last goal that, that Jimmy um, saw was was a equaliser at Celtic Park. <laughs> Yeah, he wouldn't. Uh, he wouldn't have minded that. Well, obviously, it still had it still had a bone to pick with someone because we never won the game. But um, but yeah, fitting decent little goal from Fash, smashing at the near stick. Um, yeah, I'm sure he wouldn't have minded that as his uh, the last goal he ever saw for Rangers. What was he like in the build up to to Celtic Rangers games? Obviously, he's seen more than than most over the years. It was just he it wasn't too much different, like. He was just a typical old school, like old school Rangers man. It was just like you have to win. Doesn't matter who you're playing. We could play Barcelona away against Messi, and and not, we'll find you've got to win. Rangers will find a way to win, and it didn't matter who you were playing. It was um, it was always the same. Just old school, just just typical Jimmy. It was um, didn't matter who you're playing. It was we have to win, and and that was it. Yeah. Um just moving on to um to, to, to Seville as well. Um what was that like to what was it what was it like to, to be part of that journey? Um you must have been pinching yourself, especially, you know, watching watching the team um play against Frankfurt in the final. Yeah, it was just the whole run was just um the whole run was mad. So obviously it started with Malmo that didn't go to plan in the third qualifying round for the Champions League and then um, then COVID strikes and we're playing our last care halfway around the world in without the manager, without a lot of first team players. Um obviously Robbie Robbie ended up playing in goal who had no John and no Griegs and um a lot of the squad missing for the old firm and the Alice Kurt game and it was just like scraping through one nil against Alice Kurt wasn't the prettiest with uh Rangers fans have seen over the years and then even in the group stage it wasn't it didn't get off to a very good start and um, then I remember the boss's first game was the Sparta Prague game at Ibrox and we needed to win by two goals to guarantee qualification otherwise we'd have to go to Leon and get a result um, and then we managed to do that and then you get drawn Bruce, Bruce at Dortmund first, quali- first knockout round you think mm, okay like realistically if you're looking at that you're looking at the squad they've got um, it was a big ask and everything just it's just like 55 all over again. The the run just seemed to fall into place. And just I just remember sat in, sat in my room with Mrs. and my mum and dad watching that Dortmund game over at their place. Like, scored the second goal, scored the third goal. And we're all just looking at each other going, what is going on here? We're away at Dortmund. Get, went 4-1 up and I'm just like, this is just, this is man. And I think we went 1-0 down at home and, Twitchy bum time starts and then Tavo step up and score a goal again as he always does and 
it was just it was just a mad ride. And then obviously the Leipzig game, I thought it was fairly even over at their place. Um, then Angelino hits the worldly volley, hits and one nil, and you think, well, I think everyone, every Rangers fan has taken one nil at their place to come back to Ibrox for a second leg, and then obviously with the uh, the passion of Jimmy a couple of days before the game. In my eyes, there was just there was no way we weren't going to do it. Um, it's just weird, like everyone talks about perfect preparations for for games and stuff like that. And that Tuesday morning, we didn't even train. The boss just cancelled training. We all just just had a free hit in the training ground. Just to, if you want to go in the gym and do something, if you want to go for a walk, you want to go for a jog, go on the bike, go in the pool, if you want to just sit and just have a chat and have a coffee, and you can just do whatever you want. Just we can't play football today. Let's just forget about it. We'll prepare tomorrow. And on paper, like no manager in the world would ever say that. Just like it's two days till the biggest game of your lives. Let's just all just sit and have a coffee or go for a walk. Um, but the boss handled it so well and he just read the room. He knew that no one was in a fit state. Himself, he wasn't in a fit state to to lead a training session. The boys weren't in a state to, to think about anything football-wise. It was just... Like just have a chill, do whatever you want to do, do whatever you think you need to do, um, and we're just preparing one day for the three year old for league semi final, and did the prep the next day, and then that was it. Played the game on Thursday night, and there was only one thing that was ever going to happen that night in my eyes, and um, started like a house on fire, the best atmosphere I've ever seen in football, and and then that was it. Seville, here we come, and then just so just a horrible feeling like such a such a nothing in it at all either way just just felt like it felt like no one obviously someone's going to win someone has to lose but it just didn't feel like either team deserved to lose it was just they had a little mistake Joe goes through and scores and then their early cross just nicks in at the near post and then it goes to penalties and anything can happen and He's just one of them. What an unbelievable ride. Um, what a journey and just a shame it finished it finished the way it is. It did, sorry, but um for last football, that's there's always one team who's got to lose and unfortunately on the day it was us. How did the squad rally around Aaron Ramsey obviously after that that penalty miss? I mean it must have been so hard for him to take. Yeah, it's tough, like well that's football and Rambo's had an unbelievable career. He's played at the very, very top played in, in massive, massive games before. Um, but it's just one of them. It's, that's football and that's penalties. Um, there's always has to be a villain. Um, and unfortunately for Rambo, it was him on that day. And it's just, it's one of them. You can't, you just got to be there for them. And um, But he'll have had, he's obviously had low moments. Every footballer has low moments and tough moments in the career. And I'm sure for him, that was, that's right up there for him. But, um, but look, he's had an unbelievable career and he's been through it all before. Of course, all the lads were there to support him and and stuff like that. And he was he was a boss lad to have around the training ground. And um he's obviously a, a massive name. He's done it in the Prem, got his big move to Juve, and but he just came in, he was such a normal fella, such a down-to-earth lad, boss guy to have around the training ground. And um he was he was a really good, really good lad to have around the place for for the six months he was there. But um Obviously, just a shame with with what happened in Seville for him. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it was a marquee signing in January. Can I come out of nowhere? I think it was deadline day. The news first broke. When did when did the squad first hear about it? And were they excited about you know playing alongside such a kind of prestigious name? Well, I think it was him and him and Leon have the same age, so I think that's kind of roughly how it came about. Um, I think Rambo was obviously knew he wasn't playing at Juve, wanted to get on loan. Um, and stuff like that and then to be honest we'd heard the rumours um, but it was only like that morning he signed that I think Leon had because I sat next to Leon on the changes and he was like um, oh me agents on the plane with Rambo and I was on his way to Glasgow to try and get this done and even then I was like I'm mad that but obviously a lot can go wrong a lot can happen in in 24 hours of football but um, but it all just seemed to to fall into place but yeah we were all I, well, I know I was the same. I was like, "Damn, this is Aaron Ramsey." This like that's a that's a big name. Obviously, everyone everyone's seen the rumored wages he was on a Juve, and he's coming to range. It was like he was playing with Ronaldo last year, and now he's coming to range. It's a bit um, for me. It was a bit mad. Anyway, I'm sure um, 
I'm sure some of the other boys will be the same as well. How did he score the Ocarina? It was a bit of banter, but he's, he's rumoured wage packet. Oh, just, it's one of them. Football's a small world. Everyone knows, everyone knows everyone and everyone knows someone who knows him. So, um, I remember I, Will Smith texted me that morning. Um, obviously, him and, him and Rambo have been in plenty of Wales squads together and he was staying away like, you know, fucking hell, these rumours too. He's actually coming to Rangers and all that. And then, you've always got to weigh in with someone. You know someone who knows him and, um, I know he's obviously played at the top level and he's got some pretty decent former teammates that he can show off but there's always people who know him and, and know of him and stuff like that um, and he was just settled in he was settled in straight away and it's a, it's, it's a strange world football because like you can move to a new team and you feel like you know nobody um, but all it takes is one day and the amount of people will come up to you and be like oh you're mates with him or oh you played with him and um, it was the same for me at Connors Key I've signed for Connors Key um, there's one lad I knew from Liverpool who was a couple of years younger than me um, so I've known Chrissy for a while but apart from that I didn't know anyone um, and in my second training session there before I'd even signed um, one of the boys comes up to me and he goes um, oh you're a good mate with Jacko aren't you and I was like what like Ryan Jack he's like yeah you're, you're a good mate with Jacko aren't you I was like yeah like really good mate with him yeah he's like God he's my brother-in-law what? It's like, yeah, he's my brother-in-law. I'm with, um, so obviously he's with his missus and this Ryan is with his missus' little sister. I was like, can I spoke to Zacho like this this afternoon saying, oh, I'm back in at Connor's Key tonight. And he didn't even, he was like, oh, he's just a, he's a donut. And he, so I rang Zacho after Shane. I was like, Zacho, you could have told me your brother-in-law was playing here. He was like, yeah. Yeah, he's there as well. So, oh, yeah, well, Canal, I know that now, you daft But, um, you always find people who know each other in mates of mates in such a small, small connected world. Yeah. Obviously, the memorable season for Rangers reaching the, the Europa League final and um, obviously winning the Scottish Cup as well. But um, they were obviously expected to, to to win the league title. Obviously, Ange Postecoglou came in um, at Celtic and had to more or less start from scratch. Um, Rangers, I think they had a seven point lead at, at the top of the table, um, but they weren't playing the, the kind of the best football that we had previously seen under under Stephen Gerrard in the year before. Um they weren't kind of winning by, you know, kind of high margins. Um, like obviously the invincible uh, premiership season. Um can you put a finger on what kind of what was going wrong? Not especially you no, know, like it was it was weird, but I always say this about the the invincible year, like there was at times we were playing some unbelievable football. Um, there was a couple of score lines that that went off. This, I think there was the the Hamilton game or Hamilton we done them eight by eight or something like that, and Livingston we spanked them at Ibrox as well. And there was a couple of like big scoring games, like proper performances. But the games that stick with me that season are like I remember Killy away, but we won one nil, and like we were absolutely bang average at best. But we knew we were going to beat the gaffer said before all week leading into the game, right? All we're doing this weekend is we are booming it. We're not playing football. We are booming it. We played Seddy up top. We're not messing around trying to play on the plastic pitch and and this, that, and the other. Just find a way to win. And literally for 90 minutes, we just played them at their game. We just shelled it, hit Seddy. Um, I think it was Tab scored the penalty won one nil and the Aberdeen game, first game of the season, up at their place. Horrible place to go first game of the season, but didn't play particularly well we were okay um, and then Yanis flipped one through for or Buff sorry Buff flipped one through to Raza went one on one scored and then the thing we were so good at that year was I don't think it was how well we attacked it was how well we defended like obviously the clean sheet record the goals conceded speaks for itself um, there just wasn't any that season it just felt like no one ever 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 made a mistake ever and um it just felt like we, we could never concede that year. It sounds stupid. Like we just felt like every game going into, or I felt watching just like, we're not going to concede here. We were so set. We were so organised. Um, everyone knew the job. No one was making any mistakes. Um, and if we did make a mistake, we'd either get away with it or Greece would pull the world off. That's all he did all season. Um, last season, not so much. It was like, we'd make a mistake. And it felt like every time we made a mistake, they'd punish us. Every single time, it was like we used all our get out of three 
get our jail pre cards the year before in the league. Um, and last year, we just, every time it seemed, we'd make a tiny mistake and we'd get punished. And um, and that's the difference in football. Um, obviously, we had that, we had, I, knew, I think the best we had was a, was a seven point lead. And um, it was just that, that run in January killed us. Looking back now, like, I think it was the Aberdeen game, Celtic game, Ross County away. Um, I think it might have even been maybe Hibs away as well. There was like three or four away games in a row. And then obviously we drew it home to Motherwell as well. And it was just, went on a proper, a sticky run where leading up to Christmas, we were in really good form. And we had them three games that got scrapped after Boxing Day. We were supposed to play, it was Aberdeen and Celtic and then someone else. And at the time, it just felt like we were in a really good place on a roll. Um, then we had the little circuit breaker for, for COVID and we just didn't start well enough coming back after that little break. Um, and looking back now, I think that's probably the, that two-week spell was probably the, the spell that cost us. Um, yeah, that was probably the, that two weeks was probably the, the one that cost us the league. And it's all right looking back at hindsight and saying, oh, we should have done this, we should have done that. But the reality is for that two weeks, we weren't good enough in the league, especially away from home. And, um, and they're the differences between in first and second. Yeah, I mean, what was the reaction when Stephen Gerrard left? Um, obviously, in November, did it come as a shock to to the squad? Um, a little bit, yeah. Um, obviously, um, we've all seen the interview a couple, three or four weeks before, um, when the first rumours were starting to come around. I think it was Newcastle, maybe at the time, um, and he turned that down to to stay. Um, but it's one of them like there's so many there's so many things that play into the the decisions of all the, the staff and the squad um, not just Steve and his whole backroom team as well um, and I'm biased obviously I'm a Rangers Rangers fan no allegiance to Villa but um, club size there's obviously fan wise and stuff like that there's nothing in it um, like Rangers are miles clear but you look at um, obviously the, the draw of the Premier League the finances he's going to get to go and invest and go on a, a different type of journey at, at Aston Villa um, moving closer to home for every member of staff obviously a lot closer to Liverpool for, for the Gafford there's analysis man from Birmingham and Fields is originally from London so loads closer for him Gaz Mack was, is living down then in that area TC is a scouser as well Jordan so the whole if his team get to move closer to home, they get to go on a different journey, start again, brand new, like just go and do it all over again. Obviously with a lot more money to spend and you're in the biggest and best league in the world. Um, so there's a lot of things that will have obviously crossed the manager's mind and all of his staffs when when taking the job. Obviously we were we were gutted to lose him. I was gutted to lose, lose the whole staff. Um, but that's football. That's like, the good thing is I'm much happier looking back that it didn't it didn't go wrong and he didn't get sacked like if you've done well enough that a Premier League club comes calling obviously you've done something right you've done what you were set out to do kind of thing um, and you've left an impression on on people watching your Rangers team for the last three years three and a half years that you've done enough to convince someone right you are you are good enough and you're ready for for the Premier League and Obviously, the where he came into the club, everyone knows the team's in a better place, the squad. But the amount of work and stuff he pushed behind the scenes to make the training ground better, to make Ibrox better, um, all the facilities and stuff like that. Um, I know the gaffer and his staff fought, fought hard and pushed the board to, to invest in not just the squad and the players, but like to invest in, in the facilities we've got and things like that. And he's left the club in a much better place now it was when I first stepped in the door and even in that first six months I'm sure he did plenty of work that I didn't even see as well so um, so yeah, obviously we're all going to, to lose but that's football and then a new manager comes in you start all over again and you just get the new manager the new manager buzz of he's coming in um, when it's someone like Giovanni who's played at the club before he's played for Arsenal he was in that Invincibles team he's gone to Barcelona and he's played with some half decent players himself, World Cup finals is 
he's had a decent career himself and obviously had a very good spell at Porto, was at Porto, at Feyenoord, sorry, um, as a manager. So he's coming in, he knows the club, he's proven himself as a manager over in Holland and you just you just start all over again. He's got his, his own ideas, a lot similar to, to Gerard and his staff, but he's got his own little different tweaks as well and, and stuff like that. And you just we just start from scratch. Um that's football players come and go, managers come and go, staff come and go, and you just gotta that's just life, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, did, what's do you like in the, the in the on the training down? Does he carry a kind of presence as well? Um, you know, when he walks into the dressing room, for example, does he carry that kind of aura and, and on the training ground as well? Is he is he is he is he heavily involved? Yeah, he's he's um he's heavily involved, yeah. Um the obviously the previous manager didn't do too much on the training ground. He was more um feels he'd take the majority of it. Um and then if we ever did any individual stuff where the group had split up to like defenders, midfielders and attackers, like feels he'd take the forwards, TC looks after the defenders, Gaz Mack does the midfielders and the gaffer just kind of oversees and floats around and goes and steps in wherever he wants to step in. Whereas um that changed a lot with Giovanni. Giovanni's more a lot more hands on in the training sessions and things like that. Him and him and Dave are the two that that run everything, run all the sessions. And uh, Giovanni's heavily involved. But um, but every manager just has a has a slightly different style. Like the training changed a lot um, under Mick and St- and Stevie. It was a lot shorter and sharper, small sided games. A lot more English stereotypically. Um, loads of little competitions, fun games the day before a game and things like that. And then you do a little bit of shape, a little bit of set pieces. And then um, Giovanni was a lot, sessions tend to be a lot longer, bigger spaces, bigger pitches. Um, spend a lot longer doing um, set pieces and shape and stuff the day before a game. And but every manager's got their own little different things. But um, yeah, they are, they are very different in how they did things on the pitch and off the pitch, training-wise, um, and had slightly different ideas. But in general, I thought, the way the teams played were extremely similar. Um, there was only a tiny, tiny few little details that changed, but um, very similar in how we played, I thought, but just a very different way of, of approaching it and training it. But, um, but yeah, that's just different managers and different ideas. Yeah, and obviously just at the end of last season there, you, you mentioned it was only then that you found out that you weren't going to be offered a, a new contract and um, that must have been that must have been hard for you to take. Did you, did you expect to perhaps stay on for another year or two? You never know, do you? It's, um, obviously, as soon as the manager changes, um, there's always the thought of the new manager's got to come in and someone new to impress and things like that. Um, and for me, it's obviously... It's a lot different how I can impress a manager compared to Griegs or Raz or people who are in the team every week. Um, so it's always whenever a manager changes, you've always you're always thinking, right, what's the new manager going to think of me? Um, and it's a lot different and harder for me to show it a lot of the time because I'm not on the pitch. Um, but to be fair, the boss was good with me. Um, Ross Wilson and Cole just pulled me after the cup final. Um, I went in on the Monday afterwards um, and just went in and had a chat and they were just, to be fair, they were boss. They just sat me down and said, look, um, it's not what we want to do, but um, we're just not in a position to, we're not not willing to offer you a, a year extension. Um, if you need to come in and do pre-season, you want to carry on using the gym, you're more than welcome. They even offered me a job as a, as a coach, like similar to the role I'm doing at Liverpool now. They bring me back in as a coach if I wanted to help coach. The, uh, the younger age groups and stuff they helped me try and find a new club and gave me lots of different ideas and opportunities that, that I'm really grateful for and that's what I really liked um, I was never sold a dream I was never um, between Mark Allen and Ross Steve and, and his staff Giovanni and his staff Colin Stewart um, I was never a sold a dream it was just they were always on the point straight to it and sometimes there's things you don't want to hear, but you need to hear. And they always, they were always open and honest with me. And um, and I love that. That's what I love. I don't like, there is a lot of politics and a lot of people in football blaming each other and blaming someone else and pointing fingers. But thankfully for me, um, that was something I never had to deal with once. And I had the full support of all 
the staff, all the managers and people like that. And they were just straight to the point. And for me, it was a lot easier to take. Obviously, everyone knows I didn't want to leave. Um, I love my three and a half years there, but that's football. That's that's just the way it is. And I'm just one of the lucky ones who got to to live the dream for three and a half years. And now, and now the the show goes on at Connors Key. You said that you 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 were offered that a coaching role. Was that for the, the immediate term, or is that kind of after football? No, that was for now. Um, so, kind of what I'm doing at Liverpool at the moment is uh, to Connors Key only part time. So. Um, I had a few conversations as soon as I found that out. Um, I had a few conversations over the next couple of days with um, the old, like everyone I'm in touch with in football, basically. So um, I had a catch up with Beelzey because um, he's always been like my first port of call whenever I need some advice or some help, not biased, something like that. Um, so Beelzey was always the one I'd, I'd first speak to. And then people at Liverpool, um, the three goalie coaches in Liverpool I've known since I was 12 and they're all still there now from uh, John Atterberg at the first team, Mark with the 18, uh, with the resident, Taff with the 18. So I spoke to them three as well um, just to let them know what was happening if they know anyone looking for trials or anything like that. Um, and then Liverpool just said, oh, just come and train with us, do your pre-season here if you want. Um, and for me, realistically, I always thought once I'd left Rangers, the next step would be back in England, I know it's turned out to be Wales, but back in England, back in the northwest somewhere, that's kind of where my base has always been. Um, so I went back in for my pre-season with Liverpool um, and then literally that morning, Mods was like, um, there's a couple of teams in Wales who were looking, need a keeper, you're going to go in as number one and you're going to go and play. Um, and we need someone who can train here as well because we haven't got enough keepers at the moment with the first team taking so many. Why don't you come and train with us? Um, you can start your coaching again once the kids are back um, and then obviously whatever days you're at Connors Key you can go there as well so it's been a, it's been a busy busy couple of weeks double sessions a couple of times a week and but I've loved it back at Liverpool there's a lot of familiar faces there from from the 11 years I had there when I was younger um, still quite a few players um, in the reses in the, in the first team that I've always kept in contact with and know well so um it's been really easy to go back there, training with the boys and my coach will start once the kids are back from their summer break and, and obviously doing my stuff with Connors Key as well. So um, once that opportunity came up, it was just just an old brain. It keeps me full-time training, get to play games for the first time in the best part of four years since I left Barrow and um, I haven't done my coaching since I left Barrow to go to Rangers. So um gets me back into my coaching at Liverpool as well and they've been unbelievable with me and provided a pretty decent uh well an unbelievable opportunity again so um see I'm in a I'm in a happy place I'm in a good place yeah it seems as you're definitely destined to have a, a coaching career that's for sure um it must have obviously been a major compliment to be offered that for Tech Road Rangers as well and who's to say that one day you, you might you might not retur- you might return and uh, um and you know coach the coach the academy kids or even the kind of senior squads exactly that's it um I'm kind of lucky that I've always felt that that was the next step, the next step for me. And um, whenever that may be, I had the, an honest conversation with the goalie coach down here the other day and just said, like, there was a couple of offers to go in as a as a number two further down the league, in like League One and League Two and stuff. Um, and just had an honest conversation with him and just thought, like, my opinion is I've not played in that long. I'd rather go and play at a, a slightly lesser level but no, I'm guaranteed to play some games. I'm still full-time training with you. I get back into my coaching with you. And in a year's time, we can see what happens. If I'm not good at, if I'm <laughs> goal, then I can only hands up and say, do you know what? I've played 30, 40 games and I'm not of this level. Um, then I've got a decision to make. Do I carry on playing football or do I sack it and go straight to my coaching? Um, or if I do well for a year, then who knows what doors open and, and stuff like that but I know I'm only 25 I've got I feel like I've got a lot of time left in me I feel like I can still play at a, play at a decent level and, and make a living out of it loving every minute of it so far down here and then mixing it in with the Liverpool stuff as well um, to set me up and keep working towards my coaching and get me ready for the next step whenever that may be whether it's a year or five years or 15 years nobody knows but um 
But yes, everyone knows if Rangers uh, if Rangers ever came knocking looking for the goalkeeping coach, it'd be a uh, it'd be a pretty hard one to turn down. Yeah, very best of luck with that, Andy. Um, just kind of cu- cu- final uh, couple of questions. Um, obviously, next season it's, it's, it's set to be a, another tense battle for the title. I'm assuming you're, you'll be back in Rangers to win it. Yeah, well, it won't be, it won't be very good if I came on and back the other side, would it? <laughs> um, but no, look, um, I feel like the squad's in a better place now than it was three months ago. Um, Obviously, we've moved Calvin on for big money. We've moved Joe Arriba on for big money. Um, and that's just the model and the structure of the club. But I, they've bought Joe Arriba and Calvin for the best part of four or 500 grand combined. And you go and sell them for, for silly money like that. You bring Nathan Patterson through the academy and then you go and sell him for 16 million. Um, that's the structure of the club. And I feel like you know the club have done well and the players and the staff have done well when in the last... Well, Nathan was this winter, wasn't it? So in the last seven months, they've got the best part of I'm not very good at maths, but it's got to be six, can go up to 16 for Nathan, up to 26 for Calvin and up to 10 for Joe for three players. Um, you know the players have done well, you know the team are doing well. Um, and that's just the cycle of the club. You, you bring your money in like that, you go and reinvest it in the squad. Um, obviously they brought Davo in from Liverpool they've brought the left back in from Besiktas um, the new number nine Colac's come in Tom Lawrence Rabi Matondo so that's um, that's just the way it is the, the club look like they've they've backed the boss which is good to see from the outside looking in um, the boss has managed to bring in a few of his of his own signings for for the first time properly and We'll um we'll wait and see, but it looks like the squad's in a really good place to to go and kick on. Hopefully, get the Champions League group stages sorted out against Bruges, and then is it Monaco and PSV the fourth round, I think, if they get through that one. Um, so hopefully, if you can get in the Champions League again, that's a massive boost for for the club's stature, for the finances, for the players and staff as well. So hopefully, if you can get that done as well, then um. It gives the chance to potentially go and reinvest again in, and have a real go. But um, yeah, looking from the outside, I believe that the squad's in a good place. It's good to see that the manager's been backed. Um, and we'll uh, we'll wait and see what this season brings. Obviously, Alfredo Morelos and Ryan Kent are both in the final years of their, of their contracts. Do you think that they'll stay knowing them as, as you do? Or do you think that you know the time might have come for a kind of fresh challenge? It's hard to say. Like they're both obviously at, at much different stages in the career. Raz is obviously my age, so he's 25, then he's 26. Um, I know Bon is a um sorry, Buff. Buff's a similar age as well, but um it's one of them. Um obviously I don't really know the ins and outs of of what's happening. I'm sure the club would, would love to keep them both, but um but the players will have a decision to make. Obviously, Connor made that decision this summer that um He's committed and he's enjoyed it and loved it that much and he's ready for four more years and that's probably the best for me that's the best signing Rangers will make all all um all season keeping Connor because he's he's so valuable and so important to that team that um it was the biggest no brainer ever it was just trying to convince Connor to stay and I'm glad that he has decided to stay and then Raz and Buff and I think Barn is in his last year as well and maybe a couple of others so down to the club and down to the players if the club wants to keep them and then if the players have that decision then it's up to them do they want to go and play for a different team different league or um, that's totally up to them I can understand the attraction that I'm sure Raz and, Raz and Buff are bringing in um, from abroad and and things like that but that's a decision they'll have to make I'm not sure they'll play for, uh, for any better fans and more passionate fans than they are at the moment but um, at the end of the day their, it's their career it's their decision and they'll, they'll know what's best for them or they'll, they'll like to think they'll know what's best for them so hopefully uh, from a selfish point of view of course I'd want them all to, to stay at Rangers but um, realistically the club might have to sell they might have to move them on or the players might make their own decision and go do you know what it's been good fun but um, it's time for something new um, like Calvin and like Joe and people like that have done so I'm sure the uh, short time will tell. 
And they'll round off this interview with one final question, and that is, what is your what's your favourite memory from your time at Rangers? You must have so many to choose from. Yeah, that's um. Hmm. Um. It's tough that. <laughs> you really like, that in my because like in my head, like fifty five is kind of split into two. Um, like the two weekends that um, obviously the weekend where we guaranteed the league and then the weekend at the end of the season then two weekends were like them three days were like just off the scales of emotions and um, relief enjoyment and all that stuff uh, and obviously a few bottles of beer along the way they were um, two very very good weekends but like, I think the best like the best one night feeling I've ever had in football was the Leipzig game um, and it, in the end, it's that sod law. It didn't actually end up with a with us getting a trophy. But um, I just think that that night, after everything that had happened with the cards a couple of days before, just going to a, a major European final after everything that um, the players and the staff and the fans had been through in the last couple of days, and um, just that, just on pitch after the game was just like, just yeah, that's mm-hmm. probably the. That's the one. That's the one night and the one set of emotions I'd bottle up and and take with me. I think. And obviously, there's a great picture of yourself waving that flag in front of the Rangers. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't even know how that happened. It was just mad. Um, the lad, uh, me mate, we all, me and Jacko, um, knew where our mate sat, and like we'd walk around the pitch once we couldn't find him, and then we'd just walk past the tunnel. And we're like, come on, let's go and find him. Like we know he's sat in here somewhere. When he's got a big shiny baldy head, um, so we just went on the search for him, um, and then I just seen Jacko jumping up and down, waving his arms. Bob clocked him, so we'd all just me and him had just ran over, had a little hug with him and all that. And like as we turned round to walk up back to the pitch, someone from the Union Bears had just walked on the pitch with this massive flag, and I was like, "How? How's he even got on the pitch? Like, it's not like he's hiding or undercover. He's got a flag like the size of a building in his hand, <laughs> um, and he just put it in my hand." And I was like, well, I can't be a bar, can I? I can't just like just just hand it back and just walk off. So I was like, oh, let's just go. Just had a little walk and a, and a little wave, but I didn't last very long because it's heavy. It's a heavy flag. I didn't realise how heavy they were. So it didn't last very long. But um, but yeah, there was a couple of very, very good pictures um that people managed to uh, managed to take. The amount of videos and pictures me and the missus got sent that night was a was a good laugh from people we knew that were at the game. But um but yeah. Still don't really know how he's walked on the pitch with that flag in his hand and no one stopped him, but it was a good laugh. All right, Andy, thanks very much. Absolute pleasure, no worries.